post hole here. So I would like to start and present Keenan <laughs> Kynan. I always say Keenan because I have the best friend named Keenan. Kynan Griffin and Jason Fowler. And Kynan and Jason are the founders of Aerostone Entertainment, a production company and film investment fund. They have produced several feature films, including Pride and Prejudice, Movie McAllister, Orcs, Dawn of the Dragon Slayer, a zombie. Kynan and Jason will talk about their experience in distributing and marketing their films to a worldwide audience. So, with further ado, here's Kynan. All right, thanks a lot for uh, coming out to listen to us today. Um, as you said, we uh, started Arrowstorm Entertainment, um, a vehicle to make the sort of films that we love to watch. And as a result, you'll notice we've made a lot of genre films. Um, I think we're on our ninth feature right now, together, Jason and I. Um, so our very first film was for the LDS market. It was an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, which we did um, because we graduated from school and said, what do we do now? And so we decided to raise some money and make a feature film. And that's what we've been doing pretty much ever since with the little stint in video games in between. Um, if you look at our selection of titles, you will notice that we hold the distinction of making as many films with orcs in them as Peter Jackson has. We, uh, we're going to beat him soon, though. I know he's got two more coming, but we've got a good three. Um, we also have made six movies with dragons, which... Oh, a little foldy. I think this one's not at all, so... Okay, um, I don't know if there's anyone else who's made six dragon movies. That might be a world record. I'm not sure. We haven't done that much research into it. Um, yeah, and what Aerostorm Entertainment is, um, Jason and I started 18 months ago because we were tired of doing one-off films. Um, the films we did before that, we had an idea for a film. We went out and raised money. And then the film made money, and we gave money to the investors. And then we had to start all over again. Um, we hate that. Yeah, we hate raising money. It's awful. And so what we did was decided to raise a revolving film fund. Um, and so our investors are invested in our company, not in any particular film. And the money we make from our films, we are allowed to spend on more films. And we try to make four or five films a year. Last year we, I think we did four. This year, hopefully five. Um, and that's kind of the way our fund has developed. We only make feature films. Jason and I have never really done anything else as far as commercials or, uh, I don't know, any other sort of media in the film world. We only make features and that's what we know about. Um, so just to get going, we want to show you the trailer for our next release, which is called The Shadow Cabal, it's an uh, epic fantasy feature uh, with elves and dwarves and all sorts of things, so uh, enjoy. Yeah, and uh, another thing, this is, uh, this is the no effects trailer, because um, visual effects hadn't been done, so we did this right after shooting, except for one dragon that we had done like six months before. Um, but anyway, so, so we have another trailer coming up with effects, but this is, gives an idea of what we're working on right now. One thing that we're working on. We have four The shadow grows with every life that is taken. Not even the gods can stand against our power. You left the mark. But I'm willingly. That made you special, maybe even unique. I need you to infiltrate the shadow and bring the information. Hear me first. And then I'll help you. Your days are numbered, Shadow Child. It is I who should refuse to accompany you. She is not controlled by the Shadow. Yes. The Order hangs by a thread, Celtic. Your faith is weak, your mind doubtful. In death, you will serve our master well. Take up with the rising Shadow. Join 
join our cause. I believe in you, Nelly. Are the hands of the Prophet is so clean that you follow without question? My orders come direct from her lady herself. I have nothing to doubt in my answer to no. something like what, what we've been up to um, lately. Um, am I, is there a slide here? We're going to, uh, I have to like get it out of video mode. There we go. Um, we're going to talk today, we're going to kind of tell all. Kynan really likes to share. And sometimes there's an attitude of don't tell them our secrets. But how's, you know, of course they're not really. They're just, just what we do. And um, and I think we have a lot of advantage for telling everybody exactly what we do and what our beliefs are. So, uh, I, I look back to when I was a student filmmaker and school doesn't teach you anything about making movies and we were just desperate to get our hands on information about how do you make a film, how much does it cost, how do you get it distributed, how do you make money. Um, and so we want to just be as open as we can with any of that information. And so uh, whatever questions you have, please ask. And we'll tell you exactly yeah, we what won't, you want to know. We won't keep anything back. Um, and really nothing. You'll, you'll see some of that as we go quick through this. OK, so uh, quick quick shout out. What's, what's the biggest mistake independents make? Anybody have a guess? There's a lot of answers, but we have an answer that we believe in. Yeah? They don't know how to make their money back. OK. I think that's true. I think that's less a cause than a, <laughs> it's like a, a part of the problem. It's, it's the result of the cause. Any, any of their answers? What's the mistake? What, what are they doing that makes it so that they can't make their money? They don't have a decent story. Okay. We disagree, but that's, that's a great answer. And I think that's usually the truth. <laughs> But nonetheless, we have some not great stories that have done really well for us. And I think we all have examples of that. But, but uh, okay, any other answers? Yeah. They don't make their film commercial enough to actually be sold. Okay, yeah, art instead of business, right, is their, is their major goal. I think that's really true, but it's not the number one for me. I think that, uh, that you can make art that sells, but you have to, you have to consider something really carefully. So anyway, uh, I think the first thing I have down here is, no, it's not that. Um, we say that it's the budget. Um, we, we make films on low budgets. Um, some people are ashamed to work on low budgets. We get them as low as we can. And because of that, our films are profitable. Um, the reason Jason says budget as well is, oh, I agree with all your answers, by the way. Um, the thing is, you have to make your film for what the market can sustain, and that all comes down to budget. If the market cap for uh, uh, something like Prima, which played at Sundance. Um, I think they only spent like $30,000 on that movie. And as a result, they made money because I think it only did about 40,000 units on DVD, even though it won Sundance. Um, if they had spent a million bucks on that, it doesn't matter what they did. Even though they won Sundance, they would have lost most of their money. Um, and so that's what Jason's talking about here when he talks about budget. Um, yeah, it's matching budget to the market. And, and you'd think that that's hard to do. It's really not. We find pretty remarkably predictable 
uh, after a while what a movie can do. And it's like if, if you looked at 50 movies that we come across and filmmakers we know, it goes zero, 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 and we can count the zeros up to, and then these ones will do this much, this much, this much, and we can get pretty close to what a movie's gonna do uh, without seeing the movie. Um, you know, looking at a bit of a trailer or hearing the concept even. You can kind of tell. Now, I mean, there's the LDS market, which is really different and special, and it plays by its own rules, and there's lots and lots of counterexamples to what we're saying. But in the kinds of things we do on the world markets, um, which we'll talk about, uh, that's it. So nobody will give you this information normally. I was scared to give this, but Kynan's like, no, tell everything. So <laughs> can anybody tell us what this graph says, give it a minute? What, is, what are we showing with this graph? We have the budgets in order from our lowest budgeted film to our highest budgeted film, and then we have the revenue that they brought in. That's actual money back through the company's doors after distributor percentages and everything. Yeah, we've been pretty, pretty lucky. Yeah. What's that? Shows that you're making profit. Yeah, okay, our films are largely making profit, but what this actually shows, I'll go quick, is, um, okay, if we have an escalating budget and we should draw the best line of fit, you know, it's gonna be something like this. So what should the revenue do under normal market expectations? We should see a best line of fit that goes something like, follows it, right? That's the idea, right? Well, what do we have? Where's our best line of fit? It's flat. So what we've learned from our films, 10 of them or whatever we got up there, um, is that this is crazy, right? But budget has no predictive ability on revenue outcome. None whatsoever. Um, you know, true in a sense that, uh, you know, our lowest budget film didn't make the most money, but there's really, if you draw the line on the average, no relationship whatsoever for us between the amount of money we spend on a movie and the amount of money we make. Now, there is, a, there is a thing that you get certain scripts and you have to make them for a certain amount of money. There's nothing you can do. You can't make some scripts for $100,000. Um, so, you know, there's, there's still rules that you have to go by, but what's the idea then? Given a script, what are we trying to do every single time? Lowest budget possible to make a decent product every time. Um, so we think that's pretty interesting. And, and a strange result. Okay, what, is this, what does this graph show? So what I've got over here is the revenue multiple. Um, that's the right hand, see one X through seven X. So this is the revenue multiple. If we draw best lines of fit here, what happens? As the budget goes up, we can draw a best line of fit kind of like this, can't we? So as the budget goes up, your multiple goes down. And that is kind of expected. You should expect to see that, right? The more you spend, the harder it is to get a 4x return or something like that on your budget. So, so once again, it's the, uh, the other side of this is, is uh, um, it's not as crazy as the other chart, but it reinforces what we're saying about that. All right. This is, uh, that's important to us given our model um, in that we are able to use the money we make to make more films. The more profitable a film is for us, the more freedom it gives us in the future to make other films. Um, if you're just making a one-off film, maybe you don't care about that. Maybe you just want to get profitable. I don't know. But for our business model, it's like if we can do 3x, we're way happier than if we did made 30% on our money and we're like, Another, another thing that's interesting, somebody came in just recently um, and pitched to us, they said, well, I'm doing five movies, and I'm raising a fund for five movies, and, and, um, and because of that, the risk of loss is much lower, of course, because over, over five movies, you spread the risk. And I, I was a little bit obnoxious, and I said, actually, over five movies, you're going to get like the average that I see independent filmmakers getting, which is like maybe 60% of your money. If you do enough films, you'll guarantee that the investors lose money, you know, if you do enough films. So I kind of turned that on its head a little bit, but what, what I was saying was if, if your budgets are as high as, as is in this business plan that you're showing me, and if you can't cut all those budgets in half, and if you can't cut all those budgets in half, I predict, yes, over five films, you pretty much guarantee profitability. If you can't cut all those budgets in half and still come out with a decent product, then, then you're guaranteed to lose money. So that's how we look at it. All righty. Um, 
What's the best way to keep your budget low? No, no A-list talent. Okay. That's one way to do it. It's not always the best, smartest thing to do, though. Shoot minimal locations. Great. Okay. Yeah, less minimal locations. locations. That's a good idea. Well, just shoot them quick. Uh, shorter uh, production periods. Yeah. Good. Less production days. All righty. Um, what we discovered, the very first film we made uh, coming out of school, we were like, had like 50 people on set doing stuff. Um, because that's kind of the Hollywood model, right? There's all these names of roles for people. Yeah, and you gotta you fill, gotta fill all, all the, roles. the roles in the credits. And, and then our second film, we, we ramped just, it up to 60 you're just, to see how good that would do. Yeah, you just pay them all badly because you don't have very much money at all. And that's kind of the independent film model is like, yeah, everybody get together and get favors and all the rest. And after we had done that a couple times, we are like, what are we doing? Um, and we decided, you know what? There's like 12 important people. Um, 12 to 15, maybe you need some helpers. And we just cut that down and said, you know what? Everyone's just gonna have to uh, do some work. And uh, it turned out it was a much more fun and pleasant experience to make films that way. We had a, a much better time. Yeah. Um, everyone was busy happy. all the time, happy all the time. Um, Not all the time. We could pay them a little bit better because there were fewer of them. Everything gets better. Happier. When you have a disaster, no big deal. It's not a thirty thousand yeah. dollar day. It's so, a five thousand oh, dollar day, and we'll, we we'll deal with schedule. it. Schedule. Who cares? Yeah. There's twelve of you. You come back the next day. It doesn't yeah. matter. Oh, and then things like all the rules kind of start to disappear. Like, well, we have to have exactly this length of lunch at exactly this time. It's kind of like, hey, twelve people. What do you think? Oh, let's. Everything kind of becomes much more flexible and doable. And if you need more days, even though we never found that it adds days to the production schedule, you'd think, oh, if you have less people, though, you're going to take longer. No, you don't. You make the movie in the same amount of time. We think it's basically the same quality of movie, half the people. On the independent scale, if you're paying an actor $10 million, you know, on the big budget things, every minute's costing you however much money, you have an amazing crew, highly paid, highly efficient, and maybe the more people works there. I don't know. Alrighty. Um, don't spend money that doesn't hit the screen. Um, we find that a lot with independent films. Is it's one of the reasons why we trimmed our crew down. We said, who does a lot of work? Uh, production designer does. Cinematographer does. A costume designer does. Makeup. Makeup does. Effects. And so you pay those people. Get them working. Don't care if you spend a lot of money on costumes rather than people, because that's what you see in the end. You don't see the craft services assistant. You don't see the second, second AD. You don't see, I mean, a lot of our films, because there's only 12 people, we don't even have an AD anymore, because we're like, hey, who cares? There's only 12 people, around. we can cut that role. Um, you don't see those things on the screen. Um, you see the work your director does, your cinematographer does, your actor, and your key art personnel. That's what you see on the screen. And some people argue with us, they say, well, you do see assistant craft services on the screen because cause better food and better service with the food makes for happier crew, and happy crew works harder and makes better movie. No, 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 no. The more you do, the more posh you make things, the higher the expectations of everyone, and everyone starts to get angry all the time. Like, we're going to go over half an hour today? That's not professional. When you're on a 12-person crew, uh, a lot of less of that happens. You know, it, people are generally happier and just work hard and, and are looking at the film and trying to make the film great, and a lot less concentration on how, how lazy I can be or how much I can complain or how much I can be offended that something wasn't perfect for me or they didn't provide me with a car or something, you know. All right. So there's a rate card for everything and no one expects you to pay their rate card. Negotiate everything. You can get the price down and it's important. Um, it's easy to let things slide and let things slide and say, sure, um, but don't. It matters in the end. Um, each, all those little things add up. Um, <clears throat> 
The other thing we like to do is work with people who are still excited about the industry and still excited about making films. What I find, particularly in the um, kind of more, um, I don't know, artisans and tradesmen in the industry um, who have been there a long time, get a little bit jaded about your job. And it's a job. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, expectations about how that job should go. We like to work with people who are excited to make films still. Um, for obvious reasons. You pay them less, they work harder, and uh, they get a lot done. And they're excited to be there, and we're excited to work with them as a result. And uh, that doesn't mean they're not experienced people. They're just still excited about their job, and that's important to us. So It's a um, personality difference yeah. more than a time in the industry difference. All right. This is Jason's favorite thing. Any one thing can be gotten for free. And you can make a whole movie for free. However, it's going to take you a lot of time. And so this is something which you just have to weigh up with the time you have on your hands um, and how much effort and work you want to put into it. Um, don't waste your time trying to get something for free if it's not yeah. important. You know, it's just... Yeah, this, this, is, not, this is not good advice. It's saying that it's true and that sometimes it falls into place, but when you chase it, you waste a lot of time. You can get all the food for free from restaurants on a production. You really can. That's like two weeks of work to line that up. It's just not worth it. And that's, that's not you where you should no spend money, your time. Go do it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, you mentioned less locations. If you're moving around a lot, it gets difficult. Uh, less cost, uh, it means more people you have to dress. Uh, more people who need to dress them, uh, more actors you have to put up in hotels. And the crew grows as the cast grows. And so this comes down to right to your budget. Okay. Um, you may have a wonderful idea that you want to make. Maybe you want to make Star Wars. You can't make Star Wars on a low budget. You just can't. So, I, so this is... This is coming from guys who have dragons and orcs, though? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so lots of extras. We, we spend money on extras. Uh, we found when we don't spend money on extras, we get high school students, and you have orcs who just look like teenagers walking around. You know, you gotta, you gotta cast and think about it. But yeah, those things are a bit, of, a bit of expense, but they're not as much as you'd think. You, you get the big groups of them on just a few days, and it's really worthwhile. Um, dragons are expensive. That's all there is to it. <laughs> But dragons are the star. Yeah. You can spend so. $40,000 to put Steve Zahn in your movie and make no money because nobody cares, really, <laughs> unless it's a great, really cool, funny movie. Nobody cares that Steve Zahn's in it and you won't make a single extra sale because of it. It'll just disappear. Um, or you can put a dragon in your movie and dragon's free and, and reliable and... <laughs> From from a, from, a, from that standpoint, and then you pay somebody a they're lot of not money. Free, for they're like a hundred thousand. Yeah, sorry, it costs a lot of money. <laughs> but, but so are actors. But they're a big star. For and a we pay days. for a big star the same way we pay for a dragon. We yeah. count it. We count it in the same uh, same vein. Yeah. So writing to your budget. Um, yeah. Even though we have orcs and dragons and all sorts of things, we do like Jason said limit limit their appearances. Um, Limit the locations that people are at. Um, you know, just try be sensible as far as what you write. Um, some things yeah. are more expensive. Budget than to others. market and write to budget, and then you're pretty good. Okay, how how do you what what determines whether your film will make money? So it's out in the market, and buyers are looking at it, and they're offering prices. What makes that price big or small or zero? What are, what are the factors? What's number one? We, we put them in our certain order, and we like our order, but everybody can argue with it. Go ahead. Uh, big stars. Okay, star power, right? We put one thing above star power, but star power is number two. Anybody want another guess for number one? Poster art. Poster art. Hey, that's really good. So in some ways, you're absolutely right. Key art is a thing, and we'll, and we'll, we'll have a slide on that next. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's great. So we believe that the genre and the concept um, for the film 
are the number one important thing. And this goes to, even if you have Steve Zahn, who is a legitimate sort of star, right? He's star power. On an indie film, that's not bad. But if your genre's wrong, if it's about Steve Zahn and his girlfriend dealing with the loss of a child, it could be the most beautiful concept ever, but it's going to be either you got to win Sundance or an Oscar, and it's got to, all the magic has to happen, it has to be the best film ever, or it has no venue. There's nobody buying that. We, whereas, with this, uh, you're pretty sure what you get. You yeah. make a science fiction action movie, there's a market for that. Everyone is looking for high concept. We're not pushing a specific genre. We happen to make a lot of fantasy movies just because they that's keep what asking we like for them. And people ask, keep asking us for them. Um, but it doesn't matter what genre necessarily, people are looking for a high concept. And by that I mean a concept which can be summed up in one sentence. Um, see Adam sitting back there, he did a one sentence film which was, we're going to have Moby Dick with dragons. Really easy to sum up. People know exactly what it is. Um, we did a film that we're not real excited about sometimes, but uh, Osambi. It's Bin Laden comes back from the dead as a zombie. Right? And that's really easy. That's really, really easy to explain. Everybody gets it. And What's funny is that, that what people thought they were going to get isn't what they got, and they were really upset and disappointed. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's it's all about the genre. Can you sum up your film in like one sentence, and people are excited about it? That's that's important. That's important for them. So we still believe that that the idea is important. All right. Then next, whoop. star power. Star power isn't necessarily uh, big name stars. It could be. You're making, um, you're making Donald Trump's life story, and that's the star power. That is the star power of the film, and you, you, know, you figure out how to do that legally and all that sort of thing, but you know, that's the star power. You can borrow star power from places. We made a movie about orcs. Well, Lord of the Rings put a lot of money into ramping that up and making that worth something. So did World of Warcraft <laughs> and, and these other things. Same thing, we did, but, we but did Pride free. and Prejudice. That's, everybody knew what Pride sure. and Prejudice was. It's public that domain, was the star of that's that the star film. power of that film. And even though there's no stars in it from that standpoint, it has star power. Um, winning documentaries do this all the time. They know all about this. You've got to get subject matter that has some current value. Um, and then there's actual star power. Um, distributors yeah. care about this a lot. Um, they've got the boxes they need to check. They can watch your trailer and be like, oh, that looks awesome. And then suddenly they realize that there's no one in that film that they recognize. Then they have that nagging doubt so at the back of their head. Awesome. They're like, oh, yeah. And so you often need to check that box depending what genre you're working in. Um, Action movie, need you, you need a star. You just need a star. Unless you're making something where the action's so crazy and amazing, like Raid Redemption or something where people get past that and they would say, oh, I don't know. We don't know, America doesn't know any of the people in this film, but it's so cool that we'll look past that. That's really hard to do, and it's expensive to do. And you wouldn't have hurt to have spent 50000 to get a name in there. Yeah, and stars are important. Uh, they do make a difference to your final sale, and you just have to weigh up whether the cost is worth it or not. So we've done two zombie movies, um, Osambi, and then there's one in post-production now called Zombie Hunter. Osami has no stars in it, and Zombie Hunter has Danny Trejo in it, and people are way more excited for the film with Danny yeah. Trejo in it, and they're asking a lot more money for it as a result. <coughs> two, two kinds of actors, working actors and the other kind. Uh, we call them working actors when you pay a day rate and they, they show up and do the job. They will do anything away, for they don't say X no. amount of money a day. Yeah, if you want. If you want Michael Madsen to dress as a, a bunny rabbit and sing songs to children in your film, he'll come do that if you pay his day rate. Yeah. Um, but, but there's only some actors that are like that. And when you find them, that's nice because it's like, and how much will the star power cost? You can just write it right in the budget. You know what it is. You've worked with it before. You've heard someone. You know their day rate. Mr. T used to be, but he was picky about some of the subject matter. Picky in like a, he likes it way, not, not like the quality of yeah. the way. <laughs> and then there's other actors who are going to want to read the script and really like the script or they're just not interested in yeah. what you've got to do. 
and their agents are have been told and are very very picky up and coming actors really tough right because the agents really scared of of putting them in a dragon movie before. the best the best thing to do is to look at all the titles at a uh, foreign sale show for instance at like AFM or any of those and just look last time we were at AFM in November we walked around and you can see Ray Liotta is in 12 films at AFM uh, oh. Danny Trejo's in 12 films Michael Madsen's in like 12 films like three of them all three of them are in uh, there's dudes like that who are just like they are working and you have to uh, be a little bit ahead of the curve because people are going to be sick of them after that current AFM because although like Ray Liotta has been doing it for years and he still headlines all these little yeah podunk movies all right so that's star power visual effects it's a big deal um, everybody asks for it they want to see it especially in genre films science fiction fantasy action movies they want to see VFX a bad VFX creature is better than a practical cool looking creature it's crazy but they love VFX and and their standards are more geared to it doesn't look cool even if it looks like a video game now we do really good VFX and we really pride ourselves in doing great visual effects it's really important to us but often we're told hey you guys kind of overshot on that why didn't you put a star in it okay so so VFX uh, is, is, uh, is really important it makes you money but it costs a lot I mean it's it, it makes you more money than you spend but it also is a big chunk of our budgets so you know take your pick but it's important and they want it in there for the kinds of movies we do okay action it's like visual effects they want action and if, um, if you're selling in the international marketplace basically you're selling action movies it doesn't matter what genre you're making you're making an action movie in that genre well there's also dog movies yeah you don't have to make action in that there's also period drama there's 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 other genres than what we do when we talk genre films we mean something with a dedicated audience of fanatics who consume this material and are always out for more and the channels in the world recognize that fantasy translates worldwide so does science fiction pretty well depending on what kind of sci-fi but the point is we're not allowed to make a fantasy movie which is about feelings and uh, orcs with feelings yeah, high <laughs> concepts and stuff they watch it and say what is this this is boring it doesn't have enough action yeah. they want consistent okay. action throughout D the film DVD worldwide is disappearing TV is is the thing that's where we make almost all our sales okay it's all about TV TV the first half of the movie is really important it's got to have a ton of action in the middle range because they drop people at the channel break at the hour break so so you, you you actually front load the movie the third act is always action you don't have to worry about that when you're writing or concepting or something that front half has to have action especially near the middle of that you got to come in strong you got to have decent action we had 15 action sequences in our last film 15 sequences so they're well timed every like six minutes or something you've got an action sequence and uh, and you do that because that's how TV works and you got to keep them through every commercial break oh <laughs> finally professional or slick filmmaking so this is like really good lighting cinematography uh, okay <coughs> all those things that people focus a lot on and spend a lot of money on in the independent range and wish they could have more of doesn't make much difference it's pretty down low on the list it still matters but it really doesn't help but we'll actually get back to that it does matter in one way um, story and acting quality right at the bottom there <laughs> so um, with a lot of the films you make the audience standards are low and the buyer standards are low on story and acting we love great acting and great story we try to do this we admire it tremendously it's not always easy to do we get that and we love to try for it and we put more emphasis on it than than maybe is in this chart but that's because we love films and we want them to be good but the truth is when people are buying it they never come and say hey your actors aren't really up to snuff though or hmm, the story's not Some, sometimes the Germans do um, but 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 yeah they're they're coming after these other things they're like these, these are the these are the things that are that are number one two three four all right yeah you as a filmmaker are interested in this the most and that's great it's kind of going to take care of itself because you love that and care about that um, but the point Jason's making is not to not care about it it's just that nobody else is going to care about it but for your own personal and, and you'll see why you should and you'll see why on the next slide right 
So, yeah, another way to look at it. Somebody mentioned key art. Jared did. Um, okay, this is this is how your movie makes money. Okay, like. 75, 70% trailer, okay? That's where we make our money. It's on the trailer. The trailer determines all of our sales. Our movie is sold. Most of its sales are all made by the time there's actually a film finished that we're gonna let anybody see. Trailer's really important. Spend some money here. You know what I said about slick and professional filmmaking? Different. Trailer has to be slick, professional, big, amazing sound, amazing color correction, amazing all the best acting you've got in the film, all the biggest moments. However, if we go back to the previous slide, all those things still count. You see the genre and the concept in the trailer. You see it really powerfully there. You see the star power in the trailer. You see the, uh, what's next? Visual effects are always in the trailer. Um, uh, the action, you want to have lots of action shots in the trailer. So when people come and pitch to us, sometimes we say, describe the trailer to us. I'm like, well, what are the best moments in the trailer? What's the money we got in the trailer? And they haven't even thought about that, which is fine. But the truth is, that's what we care most about. And if we get an amazing trailer, and we're like, that's going to be really cool, that trailer is going to turn heads, then, then we know we have a winner. And the movie, the movie makes a little bit of money also. The key art, just as important. Key art shows you the star power, shows you the concept, has all those things. People, Walmart decides whether they'll take a DVD, not based on watching the movie, not at all. They, they will watch a trailer, perhaps, but they will sure scrutinize and look over that cover and pass it to their test group and and say, would you buy this DVD? Would you pick that up and, and walk away with it? That's, that's number, number two. And then, and then the film comes after. That's crazy and sad, but that's really, really what we do. We if sell you, trailers. If you think about someone, I mean, even with the old DVD market, someone walked around Blockbuster and said, oh, that movie looks good, and they, they purchased it. it. Uh, if they're walking around Best Buy, it's exactly the same thing, and the TV market, is exactly the same. Yeah. What do you see when you're like browsing on like your video on demand? You see a poster. That's all you get to see. And if you click on it, then they let you watch a trailer. That is your only sales tool, really. Um, so it's crucial that you stand out from the rest of the of the world. Don't have your sister do your poster because you think she's good at doing graphic design. It's very rare that they are. Send it off to a proper. Yeah. Poster house, get it done. Get five Pay or six money. comps and choose one that really works. Um, uh, the actual film has to live up to the promise of the trailer and the key art. So you know the film counts. If it doesn't, you're really gonna your reputation will be destroyed very quickly if your films are horrible and your trailers are amazing. Films have to be pretty decent in the end because they do care in the long run. But that's not how sales are made, and that's not how your money's made. That's how your reputation is built. It's Over a time. really small world. Um, oh, running out of time here. It's a really, really sm small market. You think that it's this massive, big market all around the world? Is not. After you go to a few of these shows, you realize it's the same people at every single show. They know who you are. They know what film you gave them last time, and that it did terribly in their territory. And they're not going to pay you money for your next one. So you do. Your films do need to live up to the promise. Um, of the trailer, else people are going to be wary the next trailer you yeah. show them and say, hey, but your last trailer was good in your film. But it's not what it. makes you the money on any individual film. Okay, next. Yeah. Oh yeah, another way to look at it. Okay, <laughs> North America makes a little bit of your money. Um, it has to be pretty good even to make any money in North America. It has to be pretty decent. Uh, but Europe and Asia, you make a lot of money there and other parts of the world too. So think about that. Things that translate well Comedy does not translate. Drama often does not translate. Something really, really quintessentially American often doesn't translate. Okay, so how do we make money? Well, we have a sales agent who goes to all these sales shows. We have five sales agents over That we've over the worked years. with before, but we primarily work with one or two now. Uh, they go to shows around the world. These are just some of the shows which are out there which we put a lot of attention on. Um, and basically they have a booth there and they've got your poster up and they've got your trailer playing and buyers from around the world make appointments with them to come see what they've got and they come along and they say oh look you've got another dragon movie great we want another dragon movie because they do well for us on sci-fi TV Poland you know and they watch the trailer and they look at the key art and then they sign the deal and pay you 20%. And then at some point they get the movie and give you the rest of the money. And so that's really what's going on here. They are just 
selling to individual markets around the world. Um, another place we've started making money, Kickstarter. Uh, it's an interesting... Um, we don't use it to raise money. No, we, we just to pre -sell, sell some stuff. DVDs and make some of the money off the hat. So we can make maybe $30,000 a movie, it's nice. It's kind of become like another territory almost. Um, and it's a great way to monetize your social networks. So Kickstarter is really just another social network like Facebook or... Um, but the special thing about Kickstarter is it monetizes all your other People could say, oh, like we had Osambis like got on the O'Reilly Factor show. And why does that matter? Only because people would search for it on the internet and why does that matter? Only because they'd find our Kickstarter and buy it on Kickstarter. It's, it's the new way, it's the way to monetize it. It used to be, you could get 20 million hits and it's like, well, what can we do, put up ads? Well, now you can use those hits, drive all traffic to Kickstarter and get them to buy your movie. Another thing, we live in a state with a great incentive. Um, take advantage of it. Uh, it's got a minimum budget spend of 200,000 in Utah and you can get 15% cash back. Um, if you spend more than a million, then you can get 25% um, tax credit usually. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're making a lot of films a year, it actually starts to add up. Yeah, you um, add that to the Kickstarter, you're making a $150,000 movie, you get 30 from Kickstarter, you get, you know, I don't know, uh, 15 or 20 or something from the state, I don't know what it comes out to at that, and, and all of a sudden your budget is you know, cut by 30%, that's a big deal. All right, so here's a breakdown of one of our films. Uh, it played at this film festival last year. It's called uh, Dawn of the Dragon Slam. It's just a brief breakdown to show you like how you make money in each territory. So like Australia and New Zealand on that, they're like, yeah, here's $25,000 for the right to play that film in their territory for five years or whatever the time period is. And uh, your sales agent will take some of that money, somewhere between 15 and 25% of that money, and then the rest comes to you as cash. And you don't care about overhead, you don't care about what they spend. Um, it's kind of a nice model. So we um, sell rights. We don't sell movies, we don't think about marketing, we think about trailer and key art. And beyond that, we, and you don't even have to do that, your distributor will do that for you and take it out of your returns. But that's it, we sell those and, and these are the deals that are signed. And like I said, most of them you can look, you get 20% up front and then, and then the rest uh, later. Some of them fall through, like you look at Middle East canceled. So we sold yep. it to the Middle East and then they never ever came up with their money. Um, and that deal just went bad. And sometimes that happens, but you know, no big deal. Okay, so our invitation. So we're looking for filmmaker teams. We want talented teams to make movies with us. Um, as we get more money back from the films we make, that if they're continuing to be profitable, then we need new filmmaker teams and more filmmaker teams um, who are excited to do this and to work on a low budget. I mean, just put them all up there, right? We want them to be self-motivated. We love filmmakers who have made and finished and delivered films themselves, all on their own. And they um, can be short films, YouTube videos, whatever. You look we at love people seeing people who actually there, produce product and, and do it quickly and efficiently and professionally. Um, they do it themselves already, and then it's, you know, it assures us a lot. Um, we, we work mostly on low budgets. Um, we like to give a lot of advice. It's usually market advice. We're not there to, to criticize your script or tell you, you know. But sometimes, yeah, we'll step in and say, that can't be the lead. They don't, look, they don't look like someone who can carry a film on the poster. That face cannot be on the front of the poster. And I, it doesn't matter how well they act, they don't have the still frame. Look, that's terrible, right? We're bad people, but, but, but that's it's really, really necessary because that cover is how all the DVD buyers, and that's a lot of money, they just look at it and they either say, oh, that's a professional actor who looks like they belong leading in a feature film, or they say it doesn't, and we all know what that looks like. And um, yeah, so we'll step in, and so you gotta take advice anyway. And then yeah, we're, we're business, not art. We believe that the art doesn't hurt or improve the financials of it, which means 
put all the artistic wonder into it that you possibly can, and we'll love you for it, and we'll think it's great, and we'll be more proud of that film than our other ones. Um, however, it's not going to increase the revenue, really, unless it's so great that we can win festivals with it or something like that, because it's not how films are sold in our experience. Yeah, we've worked with a few different filmmaker teams now. The thing is, you know, we can only make, like, Jason and I can only actually physically produce two or three films a year, and then we're kind of, that's all our time used up. Um, so we've started working with other filmmaker teams. Um, like, we made Zombie Hunter with uh, a new filmmaker who had worked with us as a camera guy. Um, so his name was Kevin King, and we... Uh, oversaw his production, and it went really well. We had some of our, our people who have produced with us in the past kind of oversee it all. Um, and that's kind of the approach that we do like to take. We want to make several of those kind of films a year where we're like, here's a filmmaker team who's pretty independent, pretty self-sufficient, and they can get a product done. Um, we did a couple films with John Lyde. We'd never worked with him before in our life, but we had seen some of his past stuff. He had a concept which worked. And we said, great, get some money, go off and make it. So we're becoming more and more investors, sometimes more than filmmakers now. We still do a lot of filmmaking. But the more our fund grows and the more films have to be done a year, the less filmmaking we're going to get to do. And the more checking boxes we're going to have to do and the more making sure that, that there's not a big mistake being made, more so than... than, than oh, all right, we got five minutes for questions. So, um, you know, there's like all these different people here who have different experience with this, but I'd like to your take on at what point or different examples do you have as far as approaching an A-list or B-list actor? Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, money's important first, then the actor mm -hmm. talks, or sometimes they, they, they like you, your friends, or, or maybe it's just a good rapport. But overall, you, with your careers as they've been, can you just tell me a little bit about your yeah. roles and Getting through the aging can be tough, especially with films that they, like you say, oh, it has like orcs and elves in it. There's just no way that the agent is going to let their actor risk that. Yeah. So either you have to get to the actor a different way and have them want to do the project already through like a friend who says, you've got to do this. You are not going to get any A-list actor in any low-budget film. Yeah. Unless it's, unless they've it's come up with it. So, you know, Brad Pitt is never going to be in a $500,000 movie. Brad, no matter how much money you paid him, even if you paid him $3 million, he wasn't going to show up for your $500,000 movie. It's not worth his career. He had, they'll be in movies which they love, and so A-list actors just forget about it altogether. So, so these are mostly non-SAG and non-union? No, we do no, mostly like SAG. SAG. We do mostly SAG. One, we didn't do SAG just because the director already had the cast in mind, and it was all pretty much non-SAG. We're like, oh, we're going to need like two SAG people, see if they'll be you know, and, and we try to keep that film not sad because, yeah, it's better if it isn't. They take 5% of our back end. Our back end really matters to us. Some people, it's like, oh, well, if it makes money, you know, they can. But for us, it's a big deal to say, oh, it's 5% of our money lost. And sometimes people say, oh, this actor's only, they're willing to do it for 65000 Like, well, that's actually 120000 because our projections on this film are this much, and they're going to take 5%. And so, so are, are you buying out the production uh, so there's no residuals or points or anything like that for your... Sometimes, yeah, for our filmmakers there is. Yep, we I give mean, them points. It's negotiation in both directions. Yep, yeah. So we give points to the filmmakers for sure. What involvement are your teams? Are they coming up with a script? Or a yeah, mixed we, bag. We love self-sufficient teams who bring a project. So on Osambi, John Light and Kurt Hale said, hey, we've got this zombie script. We changed a few things on it to make it more marketable, but they brought the script. Uh, we gave them money. They went and made the film. Yeah, we love that. Awesome. Which uh, visual effects house would you recommend that's like, that can give you a good bang for your buck? You know? We've worked with a few different ones. Um, Blue Fire Studios, uh, we work with the most. Um, There's we IFX like them now a lot. in Salt Lake. There's, um, there's something many-legged, something that we've never worked with, but we know about. Yeah, it's just depends on the project. And we've outsourced a few things to LA. Those have come back nice, actually, but were more expensive. Sometimes, sometimes a team's not ready when you need them to be ready. Turnaround's a big deal to us. So the minute we've spent all the money on production, it's like, 
quick. And so sometimes it's who's available. What, what is your turnaround time on your average film? We like six months, but sometimes we fail sometimes miserably. We fail and terribly, take a year. and it takes a year or more. But we like six months, even with visual effects films, you can do it. Oh, zombie shot in November from from shooting, not script, but shot in November, finished in March, delivered in March. Yeah, tomorrow. even uh, Pal uh, Dawn of the Dragon Slayer was shot in November, delivered in June, so seven months on that, and it's very visual effects heavy film. Um, uh, as far as like how Lionsgate, I mean, they release what a hundred thrillers, if not more, a year. It seems like at Redbox. So if you hit fifty percent of everything at Redbox now is B budget horror or thriller, like um, what were some of the factors that, that, that drove you guys into doing uh, stuff that's that's a little more of those kind of genres? Is that is that basically a business or? A yeah, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of demand, but um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people making horrors. It's the most common thing. It's also a big genre, but it's extremely competitive. So if there's if there's these six hundred horror movies made a year. There's room for like 60 in the market a year or something. Worldwide, there's room for that many. And the best 60, you know, and it bleeds a little bit into the 100. But then those other 400 just get nothing because they just fall below the line. Um, so horror is really tough. Now, fantasy movies, there's like 12 made a year. And like nine of those are in there. And even the bottom three might be making something. You know, or whatever. There's other. There's lots of other fan it's, films, but it, you I, have I mean to, professional films. I mean, you have to be willing to go where the genre is going as well. So we stay away from horror largely because we, we hate just it. Don't like the and subject matter that much and <laughs> are uncomfortable with it. Um, the market demands that horror has a lot of violence, blood, sex, language. And if um, you're not ready to do that, then you shouldn't be in the horror genre. For the most part, unless you've got big, big stars and are making like, you know, a, a, a PG-13 horror or something, or something a little more artistic. Yeah, don't but make PG-13 tough, tough market. Are you, Just don't do it. Are you, what, what, your, what ratings are you putting your movies in? PG-13. PG-13 is our target for sure. And, as, and so you're going for the television market in other countries and things like that. Predominantly, you do have DVD sales, I imagine, too. Mm -hmm. But that seems to be predominantly where you're distributing. Yeah. And only in English? Uh, no. no, they dub it. They do their own country. Do their own. Yeah, but you TV's just sell the rights and they figure it out. TV's becoming more and more important. This last AFM we were at, uh, so many distributors were actually looking for more family-friendly films. Yes, because DVD is where horror sells. It's very hard to make money year-round on horror movies, so they want stuff that's, that's good for their prime, primer time slots and their Saturday slots. Um, they've got their Saturday afternoon movies and stuff like that, and they need 50 a year, and um, and it's 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 a it's a changing market, and we 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 loved hearing that. Okay, More family question. friendly is so what they said. So if if it's pushing towards a family friendly thing for the international market, what sort of genres are they looking for within a family friendly zone? They're still looking for the same genres. So like fantasy is great for family. Um, <laughs> Sci-fi is great for family. Yeah. Action movies. We're not talking which about family. Family. We're talking about. <coughs> They're looking for like action movies with a with a heroic character who people can look up to, like that's more a decider than the actual genre is. Is this a uplifting film? Is this a family friendly film in the sense that it's not about people yep. getting murdered and horrible people doing horrible things? They want they noble like heroic characters. Correct. And they like uh, they also like disaster movies, pet movies, like dog movies and stuff. Um, Period dramas, period anything, period, period, if you can do it because it's expensive to do period films. War films, um, World, War II, World War II is yeah, always popular. War is still. big. Martial arts is still good if, you can, if that's your thing. Anyway, we have to end. Thanks yeah, so much.